Hello and welcome everyone. We'll get started shortly. We'll just give folks about a minute to enter the Zoom room. All right, it's 4.01 Eastern time, so we'll go ahead and get started. Hello again and welcome. My name is Li Shan Huang, Design Education Manager here at AIGA, the Professional Association for Design. And this is Design with Data, Present with Power, an AIGA Innovation Series webinar presented by 3M. Vision Science says that you've got a quick three to five seconds to attract viewers' attention. Getting their attention means a greater chance that they'll engage with your content. So in this session, we'll learn how to use vision data to optimize our work with AI testing directly integrated into the design process through 3M's visual attention software, VAS. Before introducing today's speakers who will be talking about VAS and how you can get involved, I just wanted to give a few announcements. First, thanking our members for your ongoing support. You make programming like this possible. If you're not yet an AIGA member and wanna become one, you can visit aiga.org slash join to sign up. And as a reminder, this webinar, like all of our events, is governed by our code of conduct. So abuse and harassment of any kind will not be tolerated. We'll also post a link to that code of conduct if you want to refer to it. For the folks here, on the Zoom, feel free to use the chat window to say hi, tell us where you're coming from, and you can interact with your fellow attendees there. Just make sure you select panelists and attendees if you want everybody to see, or you can also send messages to just the panelists uh, here as well. And if you have an actual question, please direct it to the Q&A tab here at the bottom of your Zoom window. It makes it easier for us to surface when we do Q&A. And hello to our friends out there on the internet. If you're watching our live stream on LinkedIn, Facebook, or YouTube, you can also post in the comments there. We have staff members who are monitoring and will surface any questions time permitting to our speakers. Now, without further ado, I will introduce our two presenters for today. The first is Sean Springer, who has been hooked on engineering ever since 3M visiting wizards came to his third grade class and played with liquid nitrogen. And uh, he is a graduate of the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He holds degrees in chemistry and material science, and now he leads the application. He's a lead application engineer, pardon, for 3M's visual attention software and a project engineer for the Scotch brand of consumer crafting products. We also have Martine Stika as our second presenter. She grew up in Wisconsin and had an early eye for design. She brings 20 plus years of industry experience to her role within 3M's consumer design team, where she's designing aisle popping, eye-catching packaging for a variety of office-related products. And when she's not pushing pixels, Martine likes to push ink with screen printing and walking her two whippets who are half brothers. So I'll turn it over to Sean and Martine now. I'll come back for the Q&A later on. All right, thank you, Lee, Sean. I think I'm unmuted and sharing my screen. So with that, um, we should be good to go. Awesome. Well, thank you everyone today for coming to our Design with Data Present with Power presentation. So uh, thank you, Lee Sean, for our introductions. Um, I'm going to take you through a little bit of the science and technology behind VAS. From there, I'm going to pass it off to Martine for our workshop, Designing with Data. And at the end, we'll have time for some live question and answer. So. Uh, without further ado, let's get started with a little bit of introduction to human vision science. To kick things off, I actually have a quick video that I'm going to play here from a senior scientist at 3M, Brian Brooks. He is a cognitive neuroscientist and one of the original developers of VAS. So if your cortex processed all the information that fell on your retina and the, the whole visual field with the same amount of, of detail and processing, your brain would never fit through the birth canal. So, so what that means is that there has to biologically be a mechanism for your visual system to select 
information from the environment, turns out you have cells in the back of your brain. In, in, in your visual cortex, for example, some of them fire faster when something red falls on your retina and then fire slower, those same cells, when something green falls on your retina. So you have kind of red-green detectors. And that makes evolutionary sense as far as you have fruit against trees. Then you also have things like shape and edges, contrast, how quickly does something change from light to dark? And that's relevant because it helps your brain figure out if something's a shadow or an edge of an object. And so there are these kind of building blocks of vision that guide your eyes early on through the visual world, and that's visual attention. Awesome. Thank you, Brian. So there are kind of two key takeaways from that video. The first is that we don't actually see everything we think we see. Um, sorry about that. The zoom window here is covering up my uh, presenter tools here. All right. And we are on. The second is that vision requires a lot more effort for something that to us generally feels pretty effortless. To explain both of these concepts in a little more detail, I have a quick game here. So this game is called Find the Green O. It's really simple. In these next couple slides, I'm gonna show some images. When you see the green O, please post in chat. Yep, I'm, I'm seeing it light up there. Really, really simple, right? So if your visual is as simple as this, this represents the building block of edges, you probably don't need something like Vaz to tell you what's gonna draw the viewer's attention. Um, this is something that can be processed entirely precognitively. Similarly, when the only building block in play is color, also really simple. Um, but with this next one, I'm gonna start playing with both shape and color. And as we mix and match building blocks, it's gonna get a little more complicated. All right. So how many people saw the green O here? Oh. And how many people saw the green O down over here? So I'm guessing some people saw one or the other or both. It's a little bit of a trick question. I didn't tell you there were going to be two of them. But the point that I'm trying to get across here is that it's very easy to miss parts of the design entirely unless you draw your viewer's eyes directly over that part of the field. And one of the reasons why it's so easy to just miss seeing something entirely is because we don't process as much as we think we do. We actually can only see about two degrees with any single eye movement at any one time. So what we think we see at first glance is a whole scene, something kind of like this. But what we actually see is about the size of our thumbnail if you hold your thumb up at arm's length. That nail is two degrees. To further illustrate that, that's about what two degrees looks like. So why then do we think we see the whole scene? Do we think we see something like this? Um, in essence, our brain cheats a little bit. So early on in the visual process, right when we're presented with a new scene or new design or new information, what our eyes do is kind of flit about quickly. And they take lots of these individual two degree cuts. And this, this process, especially in the first couple seconds after seeing a design, is not guided by our conscious brains. It's not kind of a top down process. Instead, it's a bottom up process. Um, what our eyes choose to focus on is guided and informed entirely by those kind of building blocks of vision, those five visual elements that Brian Brooks talked about. And this is what VAS simulates. So let's uh, take a moment here to take a step back and talk a little bit more about what VAS is. So VAS is software. It's a tool. It's available both as a web app, which is fully optimized for mobile. Um, it works on all modern browsers, basically everything but Internet Explorer. Um, it's also available as plugins for Adobe Photoshop, Illustrator, and XD. It's actual predictive AI that simulates this first glance phase, that simulates that process of kind of flitting about, taking all of those two degree cuts. Um, it'll analyze your layouts or photos in about seven seconds, maybe a little bit longer for some of the plugins since there's a little extra communication time there. Um, and report which areas are likely to attract the attention. Um, and attracting attention in this pre-conscious phase leads to actually being viewed and interacted with in the conscious phase of vision. 
Our model is 92% accurate, which is a claim we're really proud of, since one eye tracking study can only predict another eye tracking study with about 95% accuracy. So what that means is we're really pushing the fundamental limit of how well human vision can be predicted. So I've mentioned it a few times in this presentation, but these five visual elements are really important. This is how our brains work, and so therefore it's what VAS is built on. So edges, um, these are the edges of objects. All text shows up as edges. Intensity, in neuroscientist terms, it uh, shows up as luminance contrast. In design terms, um, it's more like brightness contrast or overall levels of brightness versus darkness. Um, then our color contrast also shows up. The choice of red, green, and blue, yellow as being kind of two separate color contrasts is something we get a fair amount of confusion or questions about. Um, you know, a lot of people are more familiar with like RGB or CMYK color space. And these are better for displaying or creating visuals or displaying information. But um, the reason VAS is built on red, green, and blue, yellow is biological. That's actually the cones. That's the receptors that for color that we have in our eyes. Um, and it's the way the human brain processes color. Interestingly enough, a total lack of one of these colors will also kind of show up as contrast for that color uh, to our brains. Similarly, there's an evolutionary basis for VAS recognizing faces. Human beings are programmed to respond to human faces. We've talked a little bit about this kind of first glance phase of vision versus conscious vision. So this first glance is the first few seconds when our eyes are still using that kind of bottom up methodology, when they're all still using those five visual elements to guide our eyes on what they're going to land on. Conscious vision, where understanding takes place, where you know what you're looking for and you're intentionally searching for it, takes a little bit longer. It's a little bit later in the process. VAS is built only to model this first glance phase of vision, which has some advantages and some disadvantages. It does not model conscious vision. One of the advantages is it means that VAS is the same for all human beings. It doesn't matter whether your text is written left to right or right to left. All text simply shows up as edges. So similarly, uh, differences in age, gender, culture um, don't matter in this first glance phase of vision. Now, that's not to say they aren't important. And that's where you as the designer step in to understand our conscious vision, understand what we might be looking for and how our biases based on our, dis or based on our diverse backgrounds impact that. But in terms of the VAS analysis, it'll be the same for all humans. Talking about some of the limitations of VAS, um, it is a really good tool and a really useful tool for understanding these early phases, for making sure that the content that you want to be noticed is noticed, and therefore that you have a fighting chance of getting it to be engaged with. Um, it's really useful for this kind of pre-conscious part of the visual world, because by definition, it's kind of hard to consciously understand something that happens entirely pre-consciously. Now, um, there's a lot that goes on in that conscious phase of design where you as the designer step in and making sure that your content is understood. Um, Vaz is not a designer. It doesn't understand color theory. It doesn't understand aesthetics. It doesn't understand concepts like leading lines. Um, it doesn't understand what makes something good or bad. Um, and therefore, we really try and position this as a tool for designers, not a designer itself. And talking about how Vaz isn't a designer, I am also not a designer, which is a perfect transition to cue up Martin. Hey, thanks, Sean. Um, yeah, let me just get my screen going here. If you can let me know when you see my screen. We see it now. Wonderful. Um, so my, again, my name is Martine Stika, and I'm a senior designer at 3M. I'm really excited to be able to, sh to be with you here today and to share this amazing tool with you. Um, I'm going to walk you through VAS in a hands-on demonstration for a tool that helps me create content better and faster. I'm going to show you how I analyze my creative designs compare the data from the different concepts and how I use that data to strengthen my designs, enabling me to present my creative work with confidence. There are a couple of ways that you can integrate VAS into your design process. You can download it as a plugin for Illustrator, Photoshop, XD, 
or you can visit the webpage at vaz.3m.com. The plugin for Illustrator is super convenient and an efficient way to work. It's allowed me to analyze my work. It allows me to analyze my work on the fly, streamlining my workflow process. But before I do anything, I really want to emphasize how important it is to have defined objectives. You have to know what's important. You have to kind of know the, um, the elements that you're trying to analyze. Like Sean said, Baz will not design for me. It does not have an aesthetic sense. But what it does do is analyze the elements that are important for me for the communication hierarchy to optimize the designs performance and to attract attention. So I always just kind of bring it back to attracting attention to the defined, uh, defined objectives. It's a great tool to help me break through the clutter. Um, I, of course, need to be sure that I have a firm understanding of my visual communication hierarchy and the role of the equities within that hierarchy. And, then, and let's get on with the show. Okay, so um, let me just toggle over to Adobe Creative Cloud and I'll show you how to um, install the plugin. So what you want to do here is click on Creative Cloud and you'll click on the Marketplace tab and then type in 3M, hit return, and you'll see uh, Photoshop and Illustrator showed up. I've already got these installed and I don't have XD on my machine, so that's not going to show up as an option for me. So these are already installed, but this is where you're going to get your plugins. Okay. And then you'll go into the window, into your Illustrator, open up Illustrator, go under window, toggle down to extensions and click on visual attention software. And that's going to um, toggle this flyout window, which I like to just pop right here into my toolbar. It's super easy to see. It has its own visual attention software gadget. It's the only thing in color in our toolbar. So it's a nice yellow background and the pretty blue eye. Okay, so I'm going to run you through two projects today. And so I'm going to share with you my first project. All right, so um, this is a simple package. It's some Scotch Precision Ultra Edge Scissors. That's really hard to say. Um, and it's some challenging real estate though. So it's a tall and skinny package that houses the scissors that are attached right to the backer card. So we've got things to work with. I've got like assets to work with that are maybe gonna be a little bit more challenging than your average packaging design. I can't float this off the edge of the package because it needs to be on the whole back. Um, I've got some visual equities for the brand. I've got a Scotch logo, the plaid, the colors red, black, and yellow, some predetermined fonts, and the 3M logo. And I like to consider it like that these are assets or these assets are ingredients for a stew and the backer card is kind of like the pot I'm going to be cooking in. I've got to get all these things to work together in balance and harmony. And then I've determined that my design objectives are to attract attention to the logo, the product name, the primary claims and the secondary claims. Okay, so how am I going to do this? Well, I'm going to use this awesome tool. So first of all, I would like to just say that artboards, when you're designing an illustrator, your artboards should be the same size as your primary display panel. So if you have an artboard that is larger than your primary display panel, if there's no content on it, Vaz will take that into consideration. If there is content on it, Vaz will also take that into consideration. And that is not considered, that's not information that will be there in the real world. So we want to try and make it as close to the real world as we can. Another thing I like to do is um, name my artboards. So I'm going to get analysis reports right within the layers of Illustrator. And if I have my artboards layered or numbered, I understand exactly which, <laughs> which layer it's talking about or which artboard it's talking about. All right. 
So in order to get this analysis, I'm going to select this rectangle tool. And I like to always make sure that it's a fill of nothing. And then a stroke of a contrasting color. I'm choosing white today just because it's going to pop nicely on this red background. I'm going to drag around the areas that I've predetermined that I want to know. These are my areas of interest. So it's the Scotch logo, the precision ultra edge scissors, my primary claims, and my secondary claim. I'm going to go to my flyout window. And at this point, we have um, we've identified nine um, criteria that you could select for your content type. This is packaging, so I'm obviously going to use that. But if this were a web page, I could choose web page. So I'm going to select packaging. Then I'm going to toggle this areas of interest area. And I'm going to select all of the rectangles that I just made. And I'm going to say convert to areas of interest. OK, and I know that it's converted to areas of interest because there's a green stroke and a dashed line around all of those items. If I want to go back in and modify these items a little bit, I absolutely can do that. And then what I'm going to do is select analyze. Now I've already got these files analyzed. So and it takes about a minute for the um, analyzation to um, complete or the analysis to complete. Um, it's creating um, different layers of data that will go in your um, Illustrator file. And it's also sending content up to the cloud. But I am going to just toggle over to another file that's already got everything done. OK, so. And here we go. All right, so this is the information that Vaz has sent back to me. And it shows up in a layer. So I have my um, that the 3M Vaz articles of interest. And SS1 is the name of my artboard, my first artboard. So I know that that's for the right artboard. And then directly above it are my results. And if you twirl down the menu, you'll see the results. And the first, and there's a whole selection of results. So there's areas of interest. There's the visual elements that Sean was talking about earlier. There's a heat map. There's hot spots, which is kind of like a simplified heat map, and a gaze sequence. So this is showing us the areas of interest. These are all of the areas that I have selected and the percentage from which my eye would see this in the first three to five seconds. It's pretty interesting. Um, we're not getting very much play down here with these um, primary and secondary claims, but the SKU name is showing up OK. And then the Scotch logo is doing great. But let's look at what these other files or these other layers Look like. Okay. Oopses. Whoops. Okay, here we go. So this shows the edges, the intensity, the red greens, the blue yellows, and faces. There are no faces in this design, so that's going to show up with nothing. But it's kind of cool. You can see like combined what it happens, and then you can have the data broken out by each of its individual categories. And then I love the heat map. It's probably one of my favorites. Because <laughs> it gives me a good overview of exactly what's happening. It's looking at the areas of interest that I have selected. And then it's examining the whole package overall and showing me what are the hotspots. What's interesting about this is the hinge on the scissors here is really drawing a fair amount of attention on the lower half of this package. You know, we've got a lot of activity here because there's high contrast with the scissor handles. And then, of course, the Scotch logo is doing the best job. I mean, it's really doing great. And then I like to look at the hotspots. It is, just, it is really interesting just to um, analyze all this different information and then see what I can do to maybe improve 
some of the, vis the uh, attention grabbing. And then the gaze sequence. I think this is really my favorite. I like to see where the eye is going in the first three to five seconds. So it's bouncing from the Scotch logo to the handles, down to that hinge and back to the Scotch logo. So like I said, I already did a bunch of work. So I'm just going to share the other examples. So because I knew that the hinge was getting a fair amount of play on this bottom half of the packaging, I thought, well, it would be really great if we took a black band and ran it behind the scissors and then put the SKU name reversed out. And then I'm keeping the um, primary and secondary claims in the same place. And I ran a test on that. And it's pretty interesting. The um, name actually lost a few points, the SKU name. Um, we still are not getting anything with this uh, primary claim, but the secondary claim is really improved. So I took that information and I said to myself, well, let's do another round. So here's my third option. So I brought the black band even further down and then I put a gray band behind the secondary claim to just see like that's creating more contrast. Um, and Hopefully that will be drawing more attention. And shockingly, <laughs> it wasn't as successful as I thought it would be. Um, again, we lost traction with this secondary claim. The primary claim is in about the same spot and so is the primary claim. But I've got a fourth option. All right, and this is where it's this is where it's really fun, and you can feel really great about um, creating strong designs that will attract attention. Is this is helping me understand a little bit better? I'm just making minor tweaks, but it's and it's not subjective. It just is what it is. It's real data. And so when we take a look at this, we see, okay, great, the Scotch logo is still doing excellent. But the SKU name is a pop, the lifetime warranty is a pop, and we finally got some traction. I think partly because we've got these two items here that are having a lot more, they're having a lot more contrast, our eyes going there, which is also drawing attention to the primary claim. All right, so that's the first project. Now I'm gonna take you to another project. Oh, actually, before I do that, I want to show you another another little trick. So what I like to do is see all the things um, together. So what I do is select an artboard and then make sure that all of my files are open, like all of my layers are open, nothing is locked, and then say rearrange all and then rearrange them in an, whatever order works for you. I like to do them you know, across horizontally with a small gap in between so that I can toggle all those layers on at the same time and see the results. So I can have all the heat maps on at the same time. I can have all of the um, areas of interest all at the same time, like I do here. And then that also reminds me that um, the web app is also a great partner in this. So when you go to the web app, so I'm toggling back to the web app here, um, you can see I've got my four precision ultra edge scissors. I can select on one of them, view the results individually, goes through the areas of interest, the heat map, the hotspots, gaze sequence, and visual elements. And if you're ever wondering exactly what does this data mean or how can I utilize this data or how can this data help me get more out of my designs? There's a nice pop-up window that shares all that information with you. And because I have a full subscription, I'm able to download a report. It just goes right in my downloads folder. It gives me a PDF that has all the all these different pages basically into one PDF as well as JPEGs. So I can utilize those later on if I want to put them in a pitch deck or if I want to share just that content if I want to have the, the conversation really just about this content. It's really, 
It's really nice. All right, so I'm going to kick out of this and go to the next project. All right, so this next project is an updated design for a um, some bath soaks. They're basically bath salts. Um, so we have some existing design principles. We have brand colors, navy, red, and camel. Um, I've got a floral print and brand fonts. We've got established assets, which is the logo, the floral print, um, a transcend tagline. I've got some claims and then an organic and sustainable badge. So my objectives for this update, update are to maintain the brand recognition and product awareness at shelf, but highlight new SKU name and claims. So there's a reason that we're, the um, client was making a change. And then we want to also highlight the organic and sustainable badge. And I'm going to lean heavily onto um, Vaz for this because I'm going to be increasing the prominence of the floral on pack. Um, I'm moving away from this more austere work to bring more color and movement into the designs. And what Vaz is going to do is going to show me and help me determine where the elements can best fall for the best amount of attraction. Okay, so let's look at our first artboard. So here's our first artboard and I'll share my results. So we've got the, um, the logo, which is showing up wonderfully. We've got the um, SKU name, which is doing pretty, pretty good. Um, sadly, the primary claims are not doing very well at all. And I think it's partially to do with the fact that it's a thinner uh, font. And then this transcend tagline is doing really well. And the badge is doing really well. So I did four designs, four different options. And a lot of times I like to work where I'm, um, where I'm doing a handful of concepts and then I'll do the analysis all at once across like four or five different designs. And then from that, I'll choose the items that are doing the best or the strongest. And then I'll take those and try and refine them a little bit more and just see if I can push and pull some things to get a little bit more. So I've already done a lot of that analysis on these. And this is basically just to show you like, okay, what is ha what happens with these designs? Again, like I said, I really love that heat map. So I like to see what's happening. It can be a little bit confusing in this, um, in the layers. And again, this is why it's so important that your artboards are named. So I'm 3M results, N1, and this is my first result. So if I did multiple results on the same artboard, each set of results would have its own grouping in the layers under the under um, N1. Okay, so let's look at the heat map. So what's interesting is I'm seeing quite a bit of action up here and these top items. Obviously, these were not areas that I selected, so they wouldn't have shown up in the areas of interest, but it's interesting to note that the Navy really does play a big has a pretty big role and so does the red. So I'm going to share my next design. So this design is um, very similar to the first one, but I thought, okay, I'll move the um, transcend a moment or a day tagline into a camel colored background. I'm moving the bug or this um, organic and sustainable badge up out from below that. And then I kept the um, SKU name and the primary claims the same. And I'm guessing you can probably guess what those results yielded <laughs> based on the last one. So um, the, the badge is doing okay. The SKU name and the primary claims not doing well at all. This transcend a moment or a day not doing well, probably because it's in camel. And the logo is doing okay. So this is maybe not the strongest design. So in my analysis, I would not show this to the client because I don't really want them to choose it. So we've got a third option. So because I know that this Navy is really 
a pull. I thought, okay, what if I threw a band behind the logo, put the transcendent moment or a day tagline right in that band, I increased the size of the SKU name and the primary claims, as well as kept the badge right above the net, wait, the net contents. And this has really netted some wonderful results. Honestly, everything feels really balanced. Let's take a look at the heat map. And the heat map is really showing that the eye is getting a lot of play in this area here. And also in this central area, as well as the badge and this red branchy area towards the bottom. So, uh, and let's take a look at the hotspots. The hotspots are showing everything, you know, pretty, it's really feeling very balanced. So I'm feeling super good about this design, but because I wanted to keep pushing the limits of what that floral could look like and getting more of a wallpaper effect, I did a final version. So I really layered this, florals and then like I said to get this wallpaper effect and then I needed a holding shape to have the logo and the SKU name and the primary claims to reverse out of it and and I think that all looks really great and I popped this badge down here just to see if maybe moving that would help a little bit and again transcend a moment or a day is reversed out of this camel color all right so here's my results based on my areas of interest. It's not quite as successful, although I would say the um, primary claims are doing pretty well. The SKU name is really suffering. And I think it's because there's not enough contrast for within the um, font or the lettering, um, but the logo is showing up great. Now let's take a look at that heat map. And the heat map shows that the eye is really moving around this product, around this packaging design. So if a client really like fell in love with this, I would probably make some edits to um, update the um, SKU name so that I'm getting a little bit more play on that. But um, I'd say overall, this is really doing a great job. And then let's take a look quickly back at the web platform and do a quick analysis across all four. We can compare all four of these designs. And it's fun to see, I like the heat map again, like as a comparison to see them all side by side. Again, this one feels probably the most balanced. Okay. And again, I could download the report and I would get the comps. So that's really awesome too. All right. And then, so now I just want to talk a little bit about how to present this data or how to present with data. Um, I want to present the update to the client and show the old and the new and uh, the old objectives or the old packaging along with the objectives. I might also add a mood board or some other assets that would help build my case. And then I would share just the top three concepts that support the hierarchy. With the results from VAS, I have the data which I can easily include as a slide as a part of my presentation or for a constructive conversation later. This also aids in navigating subjective opinions. I think we've all been in conversations where the client or the key stakeholder has said, oh, that's not really working for me. It's not really popping, but it's really very subjective. So this kind of could help quell some of that language. And then I like to highlight the concept that performed best. I feel like this design was the strongest it had an elev in elevating the tone and voice, the visual language, the audience relevance, meanwhile, leveraging the existing assets and maintaining the hierarchy and I have the rationale to back it up. But to build my case a step further, 
I just thought it would be interesting to place this product on shelf in context and run a test on the shelf set. So I know that my client is hoping to expand her product line into high-end boutiques. So as, and part of my design thinking was looking at a shelf set like this, everything is very clean and very austere and her current packaging would probably fall flat on that. So I thought it might be good opportunity to sort of shift gears and lean into that uh, floral pattern. And then I ran, because shelf set is one of the options, I, was a, I ran a VAS test on this and I was quickly able to see that the design is meeting the objectives further emphasizing the ability of this product to get noticed. Again, with data as the rationale, I can avoid the subject of the subjective conversations during reviews and like whether or not this product is popping enough. But I think it's really interesting to see, like you can tell, you can see that the your eye is going really right to this product and there's some good movement within the shelf set. So in conclusion, I want to remind you that we'd like to, dis that VAS will help you discover and define, develop the ideal hierarchy and optimize it. You'll refine and maybe refine again, and then that will help you pitch your concepts with confidence. All right. So I am going to turn this over to Sean and Lisa for questions. And thanks so much for taking the time to check this out. Thank you, Martine, and thank you, Sean. I see that there's some conversation in the chat already, but since not everyone can see that if they're watching the live stream, just wanted to go over that. Grace had asked, what percentages are considered doing great versus okay? Uh, why don't we take that question again, just live on mic, and then for other folks, if you have questions, type them on wherever you are and we'll surface them time permitting. Awesome, yeah, I can take that one. So. It's very subjective, um, of course, for, for your brand or other really key, your number one part on your, your design hierarchy. Wherever you set those limits is kind of up to you as the designer for what your goals are. So those numbers that we give are the percent chance that that area is to be seen during that first few seconds. So anything over 50% is more likely to be seen than not. Um, in VAS, our breakdown is kind of 20 to 39% for a blue border, um, 40 to 69% for a yellow border, and um, 70 plus percent for a red border. So that's kind of where we draw the lines. But again, it's it's pretty subjective, subjective and is very much up to you um, what you would consider a good result. And we have another question from Doris who's asking, have you compared VAS with eye tracking tests with like a real large group of humans for first impressions and kind of compared it that way. Yeah, yeah. So that's, um, I actually helped the project to recently revalidate our 92% our accuracy claim. We'll let you a little behind the hood. We actually came out with it being 93% accurate, but you know, we, we popped the percent down just to be safe. Um, but essentially there's large sets of standardized eye tracking data for exactly this, for um, computer vision saliency uh, that have been compiled by MIT and the University of Tübingen in Sweden. So it's like the, the MIT 500, if you want to look it up, is, is the name of it. And that's what we test against. So um, we tested our VAS algorithm against those eye tracking studies. Um, if you want to get really nerdy, what we generate is something called a receiver operator curve. So basically, we take the eye tracking studies from the humans, we put all of the points on it, um, then we run the VAS analysis, and we compare basically the VAS heat map against where those points are. So if um, there's a really good correlation, if 100% of those points that the eyes go to are within kind of the top few identified areas for VAS, what you get is a curve that like looks like this and scores kind of like 100%. If there's no correlation, the minimum score is kind of like 50%. That's saying the VAS is only getting 50% of, of the points basically at random. Um, and by generating those ROC, those receiver operator curves against those large standardized saliency 
um, data sets, we can generate our, our claim of 92% accuracy. Got it. And there's a follow-up question, which is similar from Kelly on YouTube. I think you answered the first part already about comparing with humans, but uh, do you have any suggestions on like when to bring in humans in this process, in this workflow? Like at what point do you go from like VAS to ship, like maybe focus grouping it with people too, or is it meant to replace the humans or complement? Um, that's a good question. I think um, VAS is probably best used early on in the process. It's really cheap and easy to use quickly um, for, for iterating. Once you've got maybe more of a finalized design, I would say maybe that would be a good place to pass it off for an eye tracking study. Maybe that should be a question from our team, though. That's the actual designer. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, it was, I think they're just very complementary, frankly. I don't think you should only rely on one or only rely on the other. I, it's, it's a great, like I said, it's just a great tool to add to the tool chest and be able to, again, like I said, we've all had some, you know, stakeholders who are super subjective and this is a way to just be able to back up the data. I mean, they, they can go any way they want. It just, we're saying like, if you're looking for the optimal attraction for a SKU name or for a logo or something like that, like this is telling us in the first three to five seconds, you're seeing it. So, you know, you gotta, you gotta weigh. <laughs> right. So one more uh, quick question and we'll turn it back for the announcements about how folks can get involved with VAS. Luce wants to know, uh, does VAS work for testing like really small display ads? I'm assuming this means like small digital display ads and like how small can something be for it to be effective? Yeah, so you can run any size ad through VAS, but we do say that results are less accurate for images that are less than 600 by 600 pixels. Um, anything smaller than that, VAS will still give you its best guess, but it may not be quite as accurate anymore. Um, one other suggestion, especially for small digital display ads, is to try and show the ad in context. Um, so when we take a larger image um, of like the website, even mock up like whatever kind of website or or the, the environment that you think the ad will be shown in um, and put the ad in that environment and try and look at it in the environment to make, make the image a little larger. And it may also give you a better idea of how it will would actually show up to your, your consumer's eyes. Great, thank you for taking our questions, Sean and Martine. I'll turn it over back to the 3M team to make the announcement about how people watching this webinar can get involved with Vez. All right. Um... I'm going to share my screen one more time. Great, thank you, Sean. Can you hear me? Yes, okay. we can. Hi, I'm Lisa um, with the 3M Vez team. And we are very excited to partner with AIGA and its members in a trial experience program. It's a six month focus group with free full access to 3M visual attention software. And that includes the web app, the plugins for Adobe Illustrator, Photoshop, and XD. And that, that um, subscription time and level is worth uh, $300. And participants will be able to use VAS to test, refine, and pitch their work on any or all of their projects for six months. During that time, we'll send tips, we'll prompt for feedback on your experience using a research platform, and provide support to ensure you get the maximum value from uh, the visual analyses. And by the end, uh, we would like to showcase a project you are most proud of that has played a role in. Uh, this trial experience cohort begins June 1st and runs through November. And if you're interested in integrating testing and data into your workflow, we would be happy to have you join us. Uh, for more information, um, please visit uh, the site um, aiga.org forward slash 3m dash dash trial. Um, there you can get more information on the program and um, apply for your spot. Thank you. Excellent. Thank okay. You so and then, sorry, Lishan, um, just one last thing I wanted to offer to all the participants of this webinar is to I um, encourage you to sign up for a free trial. Um, it's a free um, trial account. When you do, you get 10 uh, free analysis 
that you can use across the web app or any of the plugins. When you use the promo code five more after attending this pro, um, webinar, you get an additional five analyses. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa. Sorry, I forget the wires crossed there. Uh, so folks, thank you so much for to our presenters, Martin, Sean, and Lisa uh, for sharing VAS with us. If you are tuning in from our live streams, we'll post the links to both of these uh, opportunities there. But remember that the trial experience is for AIGA members only. So if you're not a member, you can become a member and the value of the experience uh, pays for itself uh, very quickly. So thanks again. Have a great day and a great week. And we hope you uh, get to try out VAS yourself and love to hear your feedback as, if, as you try it out.